for every game fundamental thing, so instantiation, raycast, destroying and stuff, there is a game made only of that fundamental. So for example, when you start learning how to make things disappear and destroy, that's when you can make something like Space Invaders, right? Because mm. Space Invaders is essentially creation and destruction. And that's kind of it. Um, mm. When you start learning Raycast, you can start experimenting with with things that are a little bit more on the first person shooter side, because that's how, you know, that's how they're made. So welcome everyone to a new episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I'm your host, Carla Duke, and today I'm joined by Andre Cardoso. Andre is a product designer at Unity Technologies and content creator at Mix and Jam, a YouTube channel that experiments and recreates popular game mechanics. Today, we'll be talking about his Unity game dev journey, passion for educating and learning new game mechanics, and why he is so in love with Nintendo. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of the Zero to Play podcast. All right, welcome Andre to the show. Thanks for joining me. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, really nice to be here. Really nice to be talking about all sorts of cool stuff. And I appreciate the invite. Really excited to talk with you. Uh, you you you've been so um, so kind in, in the DMs when I when I found you on Twitter a few weeks ago. Immediately went went deep into your content. Absolutely loved it. So you had a huge following on YouTube, and I really want to congratulate you for that. Um, you have some amazing content, and I, as someone who's not a programmer, I absolutely loved how easy you made programming look um, because I know it's it's not um, it's not easy obviously and that's what I love the most about your content is that you you do such an amazing job of compressing so much um, complexity into a really simple structure um, and it must take a lot of work so I have a bunch of questions about your content but also your game dev journey and what led you to working at unity um, so the first question I want to ask though just to set the kind of tone of the talk, um, one common thread that I like to touch on on this podcast is games as a form of art. And what I love about game mechanics is I feel like that's what's unique about games as a medium. Whereas, um, you know, film and music, they all have their own, um, you know, ways of telling stories. And, and that's kind of jumbled up in games. But I feel like game mechanics are the, the main differentiator. Um, so my question for you is, do you feel like game mechanics are a form of art? And if you do think they are, do you have any examples of any maybe game mechanics that you've created that you feel like are ex uh, can express the kind of um, you know feelings that are like a painting or like a, a movie could? Yeah, I think I I completely agree. I think it is. Uh, I think it is a form of, of of art. And like you were saying, you know, games as a media, they have this unique way of telling stories because so. Every other type of media can tell many types of uh, can convey many types of emotions, but the but games and interactive medias are the only ones that can convey pr uh, the feeling of being proud or being disappointed, right? Because you feel like you ha your actions have consequences. So whether those consequences are good or bad, those are unique feelings that game games give to you. And I really think that mechanics, of course, being the way that you interact with the world. Right. It's an extension of you. So it's kind of like games are tools and they're tools to open this beautiful world of um, whatever the designers, artists and programmers made. And so definitely is a is mechanics are a form of art for sure. Um, and I think that, you know, straight out straight out the bat, I think that the it's, it's funny because it's kind of a mechanic, but also also a system, also a decision. Uh, also a design decision. I think that the Monument Valley illusion, you know, the, the, the sort of like mechanic that allows the world, this isometric world to converge in impossible ways, right? It is a mechanic, but it's also a system. And I do think that that's that one. I, I tried it to, to replicate it in the channel. And it's such a beautiful not super complex, but the idea that it conveys is so deep and emotional and nice and be beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. Like there's so many parts to it that I think that there's no doubt that that is 100% art. Mm -hmm. I think like that's the short answer. Yeah, um, one like system feature, I guess that I'd love to um, ask you about, and this is something I think I've brought up too many times on the podcast, but um, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is a game that I played a couple months ago. And the, the system of having 
um, someone dealing with psychosis and there's um, voices that she's hearing in her head, those voices actually help guide her through the game, uh, whether it's finding relics or when she's in danger. Um, and I feel like that's a really powerful game mechanic that also helps guide the story and uh, helps you put yourself in the shoes of, of that character. Um, what are your thoughts on that as like a system? Because it's, it's not necessarily... Um, a mechanic because it's it's mainly just audio based although there's there's code involved um but what are your thoughts on that i think that's the kind of small thing that makes all the difference right i think that mm. as a game designer you are trying to convey emotions and you're trying to convey an experience and if that system slash mechanic slash whatever it is uh, will help that that emotion or that experience to be just beautiful to be expanded. I think that it makes a lot of difference specifically on that case. Uh, it works really well on that game. Um, but another example that you could think of is that game Papers, Please, where you know, you're know you on the border control and th that isn't really part of the mechanic, but the fact that people uh, are trying to pass the borders because they are in danger and you have to make an almost political and also a moral decision to let them through or not you know it's a it's a decision it's a clear design decision that because the creator of the game wanted to convey the sentiment of oh i sh i need to make a decision whether this person should you know cross the border and allow them to cross it or they'll be in danger should i follow the rules should i not follow the rules um so i think that even when it's not implemented in code, right? It could just be planned. It could just be designed for. So I do think that those little decisions make the story and the, the feeling and the experience so much more powerful, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the beauty. That's the thing about games, right? Is like the, you could add so many small details that will make the entire uh, difference. And this is something I often talk about any, anywhere with, with friends or professionally, like making a game, um, you know that the games that are held into high standards are the games that someone added so much like little intrinsic like things that add to the experience and add to the experience. So yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree that even things like just voices uh, on your head, uh, that would be, that that's already like super powerful. Totally. I think it starts with having a reason uh having having a, a you know a reason for doing something that's you know yeah. you can't really you can't really randomly stumble upon um a really compelling emotional um situation or maybe maybe you can if you're just exploring and prototyping but um but it has to be intentional i think that's yeah. that's what's different so um talking about a lot of the game mechanics so if anyone listening hasn't seen the mix and jam youtube channel it's an absolutely incredible time because you just scroll through and see all these games that you're familiar with and andre bit by bit recreates those with some amazing um i, I think your tech art skills are incredible by the way um, you do an amazing <laughs> job of that um, Thank you, appreciate but, it. But um, it's such a, a fun time because it, it breaks down in really uh, simple terms how, how some of these games are, are made. Um, so my question is, is what was one really frustrating game mechanic that you tried to learn? And maybe um, I, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if there's any that you gave up on and that you didn't end up posting that, that were just too difficult or too unclear how they were, how they were done. Yeah, uh, there, I would say that there's a lot that I gave up on but i the ones i gave up i didn't even start it if that makes sense because uh i was fortunate enough to learn unity in such a way where i can like sort of understand the realm of things that i can do right it's like i look at unity as a blank canvas so anything that i can think of i will try to think of like okay how will i make it so an idea that i don't even like I, I'm not even close to getting the process of how to do it. I don't even try it too much, to be honest. Like I only try the things that even though it, there might be a little bit more complicated, I can still see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So there are projects that were frustrating because they involved a lot more than what my current skills at the time were. So that demanded a lot of research and a lot of patience and help. Uh, I also have so many friends and so many people uh, 
bless people in the industry that just like are willing to help. So that's super cool. Uh, but there are ideas that I haven't been there yet because of the skills or like the resources. So, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people uh, wonder that they would like to see, for example, the portal mechanic be explored mm -hmm. in the in the channel. And the basic mechanic of portal, that can be simple on quote unquote. But the actual, the way like physics work and when you drop a cube in the, the middle of the portal and then it kind of like uses gravity from that portal. So there's so many little things that I wouldn't be satisfied if I did just a very simple portal shader or like a simple you know, transformation, teleportation. Um, so that's the kind of thing where like, I don't even know where to get started. Sure, it could be like a cool challenge, but later, you know? Uh, mm. I also had like a lot of people asking for the Spider-Man uh, web swing. And the problem mm. with that one specifically is it's so animation reliant that mm. I wouldn't never, I would never be satisfied with like the Mixamo <laughs> animations, which for context, I, I use a, a library of animations, humanoid animations on my character. And there isn't, there just isn't enough of, of things to to make it look and feel like Spider Man because the the highlight of the game, that game, is Spider Man just moves incredibly, right? Like if you were to look at the system underneath and you would put a sphere in the place of Spider Man, you would like eighty percent of the experience would be completely lost, right? Totally, because the the weight that the character has and all these things that the the game shows you as an illusion. You know, they're just amazing. But in terms of the one I've made, I think that uh, there's one from that I made for the, oh my God, Legends of Zelda. Is it Link's Awake? No, A Link Between Worlds, Link Between Worlds. Um, mm -hmm. There's a mechanic where Link goes and merges into the wall and sort of like becomes this painting that moves around. And mm -hmm. that was frustrating because that involved a lot of like math. Um, after I learned, I, I realized now that it, it isn't super complex, but in that specific scenario, I knew how to do some stuff. And then the rest, if, if, if anyone watched the video, I got the help from Freya, Freya Homer, which is like, she's, a main, she's an amazing game developer that understands so much about like math and stuff. Um, so yeah, like sometimes I get like a lot of help. Sometimes people that come to the channel and collaborate know much more than I do. And that's the thing, right? Like that's the, that's the idea is that I never want to go, you know, and, and feel like I am the only sort of like thinking mind of it. It's like sometimes people know more, no extra, no additional information. And, and in that case, it was a bit frustrating because I didn't know how to do it. But, you know, I, the internet is a beautiful place. You can find other people, you can find resources. And we managed to do it with a lot of breakcasting. So if you mm -hmm. watch the video, you'll see that I did like a, after effects or emotion graphics just to explain the thing and it's i think it's kind of cool that video is also kind of cool because a lot of people watch the channel uh whether you're technical or you're not and i really i really like uh, i'm really happy when you say that you don't program but you still watch it because that's kind of like my goal as well is i know how technical it is but i try to make it short and digestible enough for any type of people to mm to watch it and not get like super confused. But still, a lot of people that watch it are just people that play the games. And so when they see things like this, it immediately creates the sensation of, oh, I did not know that this simple thing of merging to the wall would would take you six minutes of your video, right? Yeah. And it's like so many lines of codes. <clears throat> and in a way, I think it kind of creates like this cool empathy, right? I think that it's very important for people that play games, people that make games to just have empathy with people that are like doing these things because it's so hard. Game development is hard. So it's good. I think it creates empathy. So that's good. Totally. I think any anything that that is uh, that helps explain the process is great, especially for the games industry as a maturing industry it's still so young. Um, people don't really understand it that are outside of it, but it is kind of hitting mainstream and, and it is tapping into culture now. So there's such a, um, you know, a huge amount of people 
un- like trying to think about how they view games and if you know if games are a viable career path uh, form of art um, there's so many more gamers coming coming into the in, into the industry now through like mobile vr all these different pl- platforms um, so it's it's awesome that there's a channel like yours that just helps from that side for the people that want to go deeper into understanding how how games are made um have there been any videos that you've made that you've looked back on and because obviously there's a million ways to program and to like solve problems like a certain game mechanic is there anything that you've looked back on and realized that there was a much easier way to do it that you could have saved hours uh by doing something you know in a in a different way surely by that laugh that's that's (laughs) all the time all the time is uh the, the great thing about learning programming well great i don't know question mark i'll let you inter- interpret that but when you're learning to program uh and you're like in this super fast pace of learning and learning things that are two weeks old are already sort of like deprecated in your mind you're like oh my god why did i do this that way uh in particular there's the video that i did with the metal gear solid rising like the little cutting mechanic um and i did like eight different poses for all the positions that the sword can be in before the slash. And afterwards, I was introduced to like procedural animation and some other things. So I, definitely a much better way to do that, for example. So I watched, but the thing is, I, I, still, I still think those are valid. Like, I don't, like, I'm not getting as frustrated as I did before when I was like literally in my first year of learning. I think that now, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I think that uh, I think that now um, I'm getting less frustrated because I think every approach is valid as long as you achieve whatever whatever it was that you were trying. So back then, that was my current set of skills, and that's how I did it. And at the end of it, like the results or like the thing that you see that you consume was pretty much, you know, sort of there. So again, that point of like the experience. So me as a game developer slash designer, I wanted to make the sword slash feel powerful, feel like you had control over it and you feel it. Like if, I mean, I like to believe that you feel it in my specific prototype. So yeah, uh, I would do a lot of things different, but it's interesting because I think that I do look more into the video aspect nowadays than the actual code. Because like I said, I think that with code, I'm much more receptive of approaches. But with the video, that's the that's the hard part because you go like, oh my god, why did I not have a good microphone? And uh, the yeah, the yeah. the the volume balancing of the tracks, like oh no no. And then yeah, that's the frustrating part. Yeah. So one interesting thing I noticed is at the very beginning, like in your in your first few videos, you showed the code in in it, and I feel like code isn't sexy to show. And I feel like in your in your latest videos, it's more you know showing the side by side of um, inside the Unity game engine and what's like live. Is that because there's less code and it's less code driven, and you're kind of working in the uh, like blueprints of of Unity, or is that because you just don't show the code and you just kind of skip over that because you you know it's not good content. I wouldn't say it's not good content, but uh, for example, from the last video into the first, there's a lot more code into the last one. A lot more, a lot more. The thing mm-hmm. is, <clears throat> this is, a, this is a, a thing that you only learn while doing content that people consume. Mm-hmm. Um, there are peaks of important information well, in the style of my kind of video, which I just want to inspire you and give you pivot points to where you go through. So I don't need to show you the entire code. I know mm-hmm. that I need to show you like the that specific snippet of code. And if it's contextual, our brains will like create the link much easier. Like, oh, this is the code for this thing that is happening. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you an example. Like when I started making the, the Mix and Jam videos, I used to record everything. So literally like a time lapse. So I'll just press record and just like go into hell of editing. Just like, oh my God, just like take hours of footage to like edit. And nowadays I've, I've, I'm trying to improve my approach to presentation because mm-hmm. I know the key points of this project development that I made. And I know what information I want to convey of challenges and things I had to do. So I really just record those parts, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so it's just a matter of presentation and turning things digestible, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for people that are non-programmers, they don't do code, at least they still have the visual of the screen going of the code and it creates this like, oh, if I ever were to code, you know, it's like these snippets. So yeah. I guess that's the logic behind it. And every project you provide the, um, you know, the GitHub or the, like the code for it, right? So if anyone, yeah. if any programmer is interested, they could easily just open it up and, and look at it for what it is, Absolutely. which is awesome. Yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, awesome. So let's move on to your, your game dev journey and what led you to, to get a job at Unity and, and what your role as a product designer entails. So um, what, what got you into games? When did you start programming and, um, and what kind of game engine did you, did you start learning on? Oh, wow. Okay. Back in 90, okay. <laughs> um, um, okay. So basically I think the, the, the way to describe it, my, my first contact with games is, so my dad used to travel a lot because of job contracts, basically, essentially. And so I don't know if this influences it too much, but in a sort of way, um, I was moving around a lot, so nothing ever was so uh, concentrated. So like childhood friends and uh, and local city. So I would always have a video game around with me, right? And so first and foremost, like there's like the emotional attachment of like, okay, video games, I dig it. Like it's really, really good. I really feel good. And they're like, it's, it's like a friend to me. So it was me, my brother, video games. Uh, so that's, <clears throat> there's the aspect of me enjoying the games, but also like the video game as a, uh, as a bounding uh, connection between me and my brother, which is really nice. And then at some point I realized that uh, I really enjoyed games that either allow me to customize something, right? Um, or games that I love the franchise so much that I love to think about how I would do uh, sequels or expansions or or downloadable content so you know like a big fan of like Legend of Zelda and I, when I was a kid I like did like really silly sketches of how I think the next Zelda should be right because I saw that structure of like there's three different Zeldas you know uh, ne next four years is going to be a new one and then as a creative person I believe that anyone starts grabbing this concept of like oh my god we can be creative people we can create concept for things that don't exist and then it, just the concept of it is really interesting and <clears throat> particularly particularly with games that customize stuff like little big planet even like kingdom hearts where you can customize your gummy ship whatever it's called uh, i remember just being hours on that part because i really like the creation part uh, and that even expanded a little bit into like games that i played on the computer and then some games games back then uh, we could pull up like the files. So I used to play like a lot of pro, uh, pro evolution soccer with my brother. And like, I could just pull in like the actual <laughs> files of the textures and like make my own like soccer, uh, Jersey, whatever you call those uh, cool. t-shirt jerseys. Yeah. Um, so then I realized like, Oh, I really, I really like games and the creative part and making games. Um, so that's the simple answer. Like then I realized, okay, now I want to do games. Um, but that, I don't think that's enough, you know, like, I think there's a difference between liking games and liking to make games, right? Uh, mm -hmm. which is a key point of frustration to a lot of people. Cause like they go deep into, oh, I want to make games and then they realize it's hard and then sometimes they give up or whatnot. Um, so in my case, I kind of knew that I always wanted to work with something related to games. Uh, my biggest issue was just the fact that because I'm from Brazil and in my city, like, I didn't feel like the education or the system was, uh, would allow me to study things. Uh, my university didn't have any, like, game-specific courses. The other thing, I think, is I always, like, I, I'm, I was super bad at math. Um, not really good student in math and all these, like, super technical things. So I thought that okay, the way that I can be uh, involved in this industry is that if I study design and I start reading books and slowly converging to the world of game design, which I had a slight idea of what it was, you know, like level design, game balancing, um, all these like economy, all these different mm -hmm. things. So I thought, I thought that was my world. And when I was... 
2019, I thought that that was going to be like, okay, I think I can do it. And it was going to pretty much be like a lonely journey of me buying books and being like, I'm going to be a game designer. Uh, there's no way I would ever code. I mean, like, that's the thing. It, it was never in my mind. So I never like even thought of coding. It was just like, how can I get involved? Uh, will I do concept art or will I do like level design and create my own things? I always knew I pivoted a little bit more into the creative part of like creating the concept or creating the experience. So therefore being the actual game designer. Um, so I thought that was it. Um, and then at some point, I had like, a, you know, I had the privilege, the luck, and also the, uh, how do you say this? I got the opportunity to study abroad for a year. So basically my university was four years. And then one of those years I could do it abroad if I, if I had like good grades and if I could uh, prove my English professions. I don't know how you call that. Um, just the, just the, the skills. And so mm -hmm. I say like, look, but I also kind of like had the grades for it in that sense. And so I studied abroad for one year and the program I did specifically, like we learned unity from scratch and the teachers uh, methodology to learn unity was just completely like amazing, stunning. Like it's one of the greatest thing. I still believe it's one of the greatest things ever. This teacher was super horizontal. Uh, there wasn't like a hierarchical s sentiment. It was like, you make cool stuff. We make cool stuff together. I learn from you, you learn from me. Really cool. And also like the way that they approached uh, teaching like certain Unity stuff was every week they would teach us something, like some fundamental of Unity or programming. And then there was always a, an assignment, uh, a work, uh, wor just blanked out the word, <laughs> but anyways, an assignment to mm -hmm. to that. And then every week we would do an assignment of a game foundation. So if it was like how to make monsters show up, then this week you're going to make a, a little project that is all based on things showing up. How do we make like ray casts for first person shooters? Then, you know, we, we would learn that. And then next week we would do an assignment to sort of like, reiterate that into your mind mm -hmm. and so it was kind of like i don't even remember four months of that i don't know a long time of just like this great methodology of learning mm -hmm. also with like a, i had like the greatest classmates and just a great environment um and for me as someone who didn't have any resources in brazil in that sense of programming for a designer like me uh it was amazing simply stunning because again when i was in brazil like no one ever embraced me as you can be a creative coder, right? Mm -hmm. It was just like programming are for like science engineers and computer engineers and like design is design. So you do, mm -hmm. you do, you do you. Um, but in, but when I did that program, it was like, no, you can do whatever. If your way to express art and express, uh, express your craft is by code, then that's it. Yeah, I'll teach you how to code. There's no difference mm -hmm. between like, you need to be, you need to go into the computer science program. Mm -hmm. And that was just empowering and amazing and amazing. Uh, and so when I went, when I went back to Brazil, I had to find different ways to practice that. So I started like everyone making like indie games, participating in game jams. Um, I even got my first job as a, as a game developer slash designer, working with educational games. Uh, but I'm such a crazy, like, have to do things in, in the free time to always learn, like the always, uh, the ever learner, ever learner mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm. that I, I, the last thing in that process of like, let's do things to learn. The last thing I decided to make was the channel mm -hmm. because I, I had this idea of like, I'm playing games and I know Unity enough now that I can see like, huh, how, how would I make this? You know, how would I approach this? Because I know... Like Nintendo developers, they like they're probably geniuses. They're doing like crazy, like brilliant stuff. Um, but I wonder how would I do it? And so I had this idea of I don't want to do tutorials. I want to do something that is it's just a journey, really. It's just like here's the thing and I'm going to try. And the mm -hmm. code is open. Like I, you, like a lot of people are much better. A lot of people more smart and more organized, more optimized code and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it. And then um, I started doing that while I, while I had my first job, which was being a game designer slash developer. 
Um, so I was already going naturally into a path of the game industry, but the, the channel, what was really accelerated it uh, into something I've never seen. And I'm super, super grateful for and lucky and privileged. Uh, like it just grew up. And then a lot of people started like showcasing interest and showcasing that they appreciated. A lot of people said that it really helped them. So it was really nice. And that when I had that, it, some opportunities started showing up of like other things that I could do. Um, and I was always super excited to, if I ever had an opportunity abroad again, I was always someone to embrace and just go with it. Uh, and at the moment, at the time, when I was working with the videos, which I make things with Unity, Unity was one of the companies to approach me, right? And so for mm -hmm. me, it made so much sense. Like it was perfect. It was something that I would just like be so excited. And I do really like Unity, the software a lot. You know, I, I really like it. So working for the company that will allow me to make something that I myself use and improve whatever it is that I'm, I'm working on, it's just, it, it was amazing, the concept back then. And so I mm -hmm. started at Unity as a, uh, now it's called an advocate. So I was just making like the online content. So I was making videos for Unity as well on their YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that was my first role. And then, you know, I got, I got an opportunity to do an internal transfer and like start being a product designer. And essentially, you know, for me, it's really good because I still will find reasons to use Unity every day, even if it's mix and jam or if it's like something work related. And then at the end of the day, I just take all that feedback, take all that, the issues that we have and that our users have and like try to tweak the engine and improve, improve it, right? Which is something I love doing. Um, and so far, that's kind of it. But there's so much ahead, you know, like I think. Totally. But yeah. That's incredible. What an, what an amazing journey. Um, and I I wanted to just let you speak it from beginning to end because you, you mentioned some really inspiring things. And it sounds like that um, that teacher that you had really, really helped just kind of root in the potential of, of the game engine, having like a crash course that was like action-based. I, I really loved hearing that. Um, and, and I don't think a lot of people have that experience when they try get into programming. So me, for example, I'm, I'm not a programmer, but I have tried on like three occasions to learn, um, unreal. That's what, that's what we do. We use, um, as an engine at the company I currently work at and I've done Udemy courses. Um, and I, I've like slowly like bit off a little bit more each time, you know, learning programming, learning, uh, blueprinting. Um, but I guess, I, I didn't have like a similar experience to what you had and um and and that's kind of made like hearing you say that's kind of motivated me to maybe try again um with a different approach and i I, I might look into learning unity and and I guess a question would be what would be like a good first game mechanic that you would recommend to someone just starting out that's um probably not like a beginner beginner but someone that is familiar with game engines and you know kind of wants to get to um something that kind of gives that endorphin release of of having developed something what would you recommend yeah um yeah no that's true um okay so first i think that first shout out to my teacher benjamin norskov uh <laughs> and all my classmates that helped me so much um yeah what would be the mechanic that i would recommend i as i kind of said to you in the beginning I would go for mechanics that include the fundamentals that you've learned so far, right? And so for every game fundamental thing, so instantiation, raycast, destroying and stuff, there is a game made only of that fundamental. So for example, when you start learning how to make things disappear and destroy, that's when you can make something like Space Invaders, right? Because mm. Space Invaders is essentially creation and destruction. And that's kind of it um, mm -hmm. when you start learning raycasts you can start experimenting with with things that are a little bit more on the first person shooter side because that's how you know that's how they're made so so i would start doing mechanics that relate to the to the current skill that you have right the mm -hmm. current fundamental that you learned so for example if you only learn so far to like i press a key and then i make my character jump or add some force then you can make flappy bird Right. Mm -hmm. That's like a simple example. Um, and then the more you get into the knowledge of the fundamentals, 
then you start going like, oh, I see. I see how this is made. I see how I can make this and that. So I don't think the mechanic should be the, like the driven force, the driving force. But I think that it should be more of a sense of these are the things I know. Mm -hmm. And you're watching different, different things. And then you're saying, oh, I can make this. But if I were to give a concrete example, and it's hard for me to say because I've, I've been in this journey so far that maybe I've lost a little bit of the touch and maybe it's super simple for me and then it's not really, but I hope it still is. But I really like Mario Party and the many games that are included in Mario Party as example because every time I watch it, I watch the mini games, I'm like, these are just very simple fundamentals. Things show up, things disappear, you know. Uh, so mm -hmm. you can, there's a, a, a solid example, I think is honestly, a lot of people would benefit from trying to recreate Mario Party minigames without the multiplayer component. Mm -hmm. Like it's pretend it's just a single player thing. And then it's just like you running around. Um, you can make a lot out of it a lot. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of simple Mario Party games, especially in the N64 era where they needed to make the code of the games like really cheap and not expensive. So they're just like very simple and they reuse a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. movement uh, entering triggers grabbing coins so yeah yeah your um your video um where you use the game builder garage to recreate um the mario party games is incredible and and that was so insightful to see and that just showed for me that that's what showed your me your passion for game development because it's it's using this tool that I don't know. I, I I don't know if if Game Builder Garage has a bunch of content, but that was an incredible uh, selling like uh, experience to see just the like what is possible. And and I'm amazed that you're able to recreate those games um, using using that tool. And that 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 kind of leads into the next um, chunk of discussion that I want to have. And that's why you love Nintendo so much as <laughs> as a brand, as a company. Uh, like what what does Nintendo mean to you? Everything. Uh, I never, never thought about it. And I ac never actually said this phrase, but it does. Um, it does because like I said, it's such, ha I have such an emotional attachment to it. Um, maybe it's because of, it, I was introduced to that, right? Like uh, when I was young and then I think I had a, a super Nintendo. So first that's like the emotional attachment, but I really believe that like Nintendo is one of the companies that they really strive for fun. Mm -hmm. The focus is fun. Right. And so, you know, I think that there are many ways to tell stories in games and all of them are valid and to 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 make experiences in games. But you will notice that Nintendo always does it the opposite way where they think of the mechanic. And then once that is sweet and juicy and super nice to play, then they'll think about the world that sells that. Right. So Splatoon is a good example because they just were prototyping the idea of shooting ink and then entering the ink and leaving the ink as a way to movement. They, they did that with just cubes. Mm -hmm. I remember it was like, I, I think there was a prototype name or a joke or something that it was just called tofu, tofu shooting, you know, ink something. I think it was because they really just focus on that. Like once you have that and it's super juicy, then they're like, what's the, the what's the perfect excuse? Oh, these kids are inklings. They're like half human, half, uh, how do you call them? Inklings or whatever. Squid. Just, squids perfect perfect uh half half human half squids and then it, that's the world they created and i really believe in that is mm -hmm. in, in my philosophy right is like in my world i think that having fun is number one then we build the the world surrounding it right so yeah that's the yeah. it's 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 like it's like mario odyssey like oh let's think about a mechanic it would be really cool if mario would like catch the the enemies and transform into them if you throw the hat uh and then the world is all about hats everything is hat like everything's hat related uh there's like different hats and stuff and so yeah super cool it's fun <laughs> yeah it's fun it's fun i don't know what to say it's just fun and I, I i love nintendo and everything they do is just uh i've been a fan and i think they do really quality stuff really good quality stuff yeah mm-hmm that's awesome. Um, uh, would you would you uh, like to work for Nintendo one day? Is that on your on your bucket list? Ooh, um, yeah, absolutely. Cool. The thing is, like, I think the only thing I would be careful for myself is I don't know if I would love to work in a trip like big triple A scale thing. You know, I think 
I think that my ideal work scenario, for example, working for Nintendo, would be like working mid-size in a smaller team that works with the IP and then makes these like games that are smaller in scale. Mm -hmm. Just, just you know, it's kind of it's almost like vanity of of being involved in the creative process, right? Because if you work mm -hmm. in a game that is huge. Um, you're going to make like a, an individual part, which is still very important. And a lot of people, for example, the thousands of people that made Breath of the Wild is still an, a, a huge ac accomplishment. But I would, in the more indie sense, I would mm -hmm. love to be part of like a bigger role in terms of thinking about the idea together, thinking about the design decisions and the artistic world and the lore. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and in Nintendo specifically, there are examples of companies that are second party. They make like mm -hmm. smaller games. I think that would be cool, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see. We'll see how. Would we'll would see what the what the future holds. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, so talking a bit about the future of Mix and Jam, um, I I loved seeing the uh, the video you made on the last uh, Mix and Game Jam with. There was over 600 entries and it was like top 10 on itch.io for uh, as like a game jam and uh the the theme that you showcased of mixing genres was incredible the games that you uh, highlighted were amazing and i loved the kind of community that that you're building there i noticed there hasn't been one for the last two years probably covid related but i'd love to know if there's one coming up if you can share anything about it, and if not, just what the future of the Mix and Jam page is at the moment, if there are any videos up and coming that you can talk about. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, am I getting crazy or, I think I made one for 2020, but not 2021. Yeah. Okay, That's right. yeah, so yeah, it, it is kind of COVID related. And the thing about, the thing about Mix and Jam in general is, um, while I do have a lot of people helping me out and collaborating and, and supporting, it's just me um, mm -hmm. in the sense of like the brand and everything. Of course, like the videos wouldn't exist with all the people helping, but um, it's just a lot of work. And the Game Jam specifically is even more work than the actual channel. There's so much to it. There's so much pressure and there's so much to organize because I am someone that really likes to see everyone happy and not frustrated with like, little technical things that I missed. So it's really stressing, I think, like making sure that everything is available, making sure that the time is available. Um, I remember that in this last jam, there was a time frame, and then a lot of people were missing it. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know what to do because I hate seeing people not being able to deliver the game. So I would open, you know, I would be like, yeah, just send me an email and I'll add that manually to the game jam because... You know, just trying to be that. And, and that, at the end of the day, that is a lot, you know, psychologically speaking. So mm -hmm. definitely like there's there's that. And there's also the fact that, um, yeah, it's hard to like because because Mix and Jam is like a balance also because I have two jobs, right? I have mm -hmm. like Unity, I have Mix and Jam. I often there's a lot of months where I'm like, OK, I'm, I need to prioritize like what I do with my with my life and hang out with my friends and go out and do stuff and cook and do something else that is not computer related. Um, but yeah, I want to make a game jam this year for sure. Like that's for sure. Uh, what month? I don't know. I think that when I feel it, I feel that it'll happen. And hopefully people are still hyped for it. Uh, not sure like because I missed it last year. I don't know how people are perceiving it, but that's definitely going to happen. Um, and for the videos, I have, I have three to four topics that are constantly in my mind that I know that I will follow. There's also the people that vote on the polls in my Patreon. Mm -hmm. So for example, they voted last time for the Wind Waker sailing mechanic, like the water, the whole like sailing thing. So that's something I'm exploring. Um, but that's the other part is nowadays with Making Jam, I'm being a lot more relaxed with time. I'm mm -hmm. like opening the project, trying it very slowly and seeing if it's good. Uh, as opposed to before, which I was really trying to shoot as many projects as I could because I, I was in the hype of the moment. But now I feel like I can deliver stuff with quality if I just like calmly look at it and see it. But I want my next video to be Wind Waker related. Let's see if that works out. Hopefully, hopefully it works <laughs> out because I really love that game. It's one of my favorite games. And so mm -hmm. that would also be a very special video for me, just like the Mario Galaxy video, which for me is like so special because 
is Mario Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, honestly, those are the plans. Like continuing doing these mechanics, I think that people that's what people that's why people are subscribed to. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought about doing other stuff some period in the past. Like, oh, I wonder if I should make videos about other stuff, not just mechanic recreation, but. Um, you know, it's it's a. I think it's a win-win for everyone. Like, uh, I think that people subscribe to that, and also for me, is like I, I will always learn, and people will always learn, and we all share. So I think it's positive in general. So I think mm-hmm. I'm gonna keep doing that. Um, I think that I, the other video that I was planning to do at some point, because Mix and Jam was almost turning three years old, was I wanted to make a video about a sum up of why I think recreating game mechanics is a good way to to learn. So I was thinking about doing a video like that, but that would take time away from the actual game mechanics. So it's a <laughs> it's a complicated world of deciding the things. Um, but I'm I'm very very happy and proud that I've built an audience that, honestly, like no one pressures me. The only person that pressures me is like myself. I'm the only one going like I've been two months without posting, three months. Am I crazy? Um, because everyone has very decent awareness of how how much it takes to make videos like this right so if you think about it I have like the unity project the folder organization structure for github and then there's like the video script then there's the voice recording then there's mm-hmm. like the video editing then there's the publishing then there's like the social media aspect of like oh i did a post on twitter and then i did a post on instagram and all these different things that can take so much time um but it's still fun, so that's why I'm taking I'm I'm taking the time to appreciate those parts, because so I think that once you do it a lot, a lot, you you start you stop appreciating, just getting annoyed by it. I, I want to mm-hmm. appreciate those. I like posting. I love the reception. Everything is awesome. So I just want it to keep awesome, and it was a very mm-hmm. conscious decision to keep mix and jam as my hobby, and not the job, if that makes sense. Because mm-hmm. um, it still it's it still feels mag- magical still to this day. And I still have fun with it, you know, while still providing those videos. Totally. I mean, it's amazing. You have a great catalog there. And, and what I love is that it's not reliant on trends. You're not, you're not trying to recreate the, the Spider-Man swing the same weekend that, um, the next, the last Spider-Man game comes out, you know, it's, it's, um, it's almost like a piece of art in itself It's something that's timeless that you can go revisit in a couple years time and and see what it was like back then to recreate that game mechanic and um that would be actually a cool concept as in in a couple years you recreating a same game mechanic that you had recreated previously but recreating it differently that would be interesting. I'd, I'd be interested to see how how you've how much you've grown in the last few years and um I and as, about as, as as game engines progress as well it's just i feel like it's going to make making games easier um, and that's what I'm just uh, observing from my end as someone who's, uh, you know, not committed to being a programmer. As as will games ever get to a point that uh, maybe no code, uh, being able to develop game mechanics with, with no code, um, and and how that uh, looks. Uh, one one question I have is is what are your thoughts on the future of of game engines like Unity? Is there any kind of big um, shift that you see on the horizon? Uh, any big like features coming that you think will change the way people develop games? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, kind of like we were, you were saying. I think that the big, the big future of game engines is the, just the accessibility in general. So whether that's m- you know meaning that Unity or other game engines will be easily accessible from the web or that you can scan objects from the world that you see and then you ex- import them. And exactly like you said, like in a future where there is almost no code, I think that is the big thing for game development because games and game development, they have this huge stigma attached to them. Like it's like, th- it's for kids, um, it's very male oriented and all of these things, the only way that we can change those things, those stigmas, are if we just give that power to more people and not create this huge barrier. So for me, it's not too much about the features and the technology. I mean, sure, like in the future, the light rendering techniques will be better, it will be less expensive, but I don't think that's the part where I particularly look forward to the horizon. For me, it's more of like, the more people making stuff, that's that's the best thing, right? Because the thing is, and I make this parallel all the time where 
if you think about writing books, you know, the resources that you need to make that uh, in, a, in a way are very little, right? Technically, you only need like a paper and a pen and just write it down, right? So by having such a short learning curve, what it means is that you will see books about everything, right? Mm -hmm. You'll see books about everything, every topic. You know, you'll be about entertainment, education. It doesn't matter. And then you have all sorts of authors like doing different things. Um, and so you also see this trend with movies, right? The more movies are accessible, the more movies are made about everything. Because once there is like a huge learning curve or some sort of stigma to something, movies or books will be very similar if they're all written by the same type of people. Right, mm -hmm. same type of people are like doing the things. And so the more people have access to it, like now you can make movies with your iPhone, with the cameras that the iPhone provide. Then a lot of people can do movies. And then uh, video editing software is like more accessible and then people can just do stuff. And then you see like all these different movies about anything. And that's what I want game development to be in the future. I want mm -hmm. anyone to see it without the stigma of like, games are just like pew pew, shoot shoot, you know, like get coins and all these kind of things. It's, it's a form of art. And then if people see it as a wide canvas, they can express themselves as they wish. They can talk about anything, right? So I really want game, the game industry to be more accessible, more diverse. And I just want it to be, you know, I just want people to be able to create different things. I think that every game developer is different from where they come from, from uh, their background just in general. And I think that if Unity is like, or, or any game engine really, is like, it's a website that I can enter and I can start making things and then I can send you the link as someone who's not technical because as you know, the game development barrier is so huge that there's a lot of people that could be making games and there are not. And I know for a fact there are a lot of people that would be brilliant making games, but they don't because the barrier is so huge. But I think that, yeah, with VR, with AR, like all these things, uh, game development will just become more accessible. And I think, Accessible, accessible, yeah, mm -hmm. accessible, and uh, I don't know. I'm not too much into the features, focusing on the features. I'm more about like just easy. A, a good example is okay. This is a feature one, so I'll give you this. I'll give you a feature systematic thing. So, for example, like can we render GPUs on the cloud? Can we not uh, make it so that your computer needs to be like this crazy machine to run it? So can it be run in the cloud and then you can stream anything from it? Can we do that? I think that will enable people to load super mm -hmm. high, fidelity, high, high fidelity game creation while not needing to have like a beast machine or, mm -hmm. or that. So yeah, that's what that's I think great. for the future. That's what I hope I, for the future. I love that. I, I love your, your passion for it. And um, I hope to look back on this conversation in a few years and to just see the kind of leaps that, that we've made and the kind of new stories and, and games and game mechanics that are being explored uh, by people who never would have considered it now. Uh, so yeah. that's that's really exciting. Um, that's kind of all the all the time that we have for, but I've absolutely loved this conversation. I feel like I could talk to you for hours and I, I continue to, to learn from you uh, with everything that you say, with the experience that you have. Uh, and I'm definitely going to keep an eye on you and, and what you work on, what you're working on at Unity, what you decide to work on at Mix and Jam. Um, and, and I just think you have a, a real passion for, for games and you, you're you doing a great job of just representing the industry and providing content to help build the industry. So um, thank you so much for your time. If anyone listening is interested in following Andre, you can find him on Twitter at Andre underscore MC. Um, I'll have links in the description below to the Mix and Jam YouTube channel, um, his Twitter page, and any other links that um, that I can find of his. Um, the last question I want to ask before we head off, um, and this is a very broad question, and you can keep it short and snappy, whatever first comes to mind, is why do you love games as a medium? Um, hmm. I think, I think they're kind of like the physical representation, digital representation of fun. Oh, Such an yeah. abstract word, hard to put it in into like physical and thugs, but they're just fun. And fun is, 
is the art of learning, the art of creating. It's just fun. So uh, that's why I love games. They're fun. Love it. Yeah, that's that's perfect. You can't describe a a song as being fun. It just doesn't. I mean, it, it might feel fun, but it's not physically fun um, to participate in. So I love that. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for your time and uh, and coming I, onto the show. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I I agree. Like I could be talking so much. I think this was like a really chill conversation and yeah i really like your idea of seeing this as a time capsule and seeing how much we progressed so i'm also looking forward to that and yeah um thanks for everyone listening thanks for you know listening to me just like saying so much random stuff but i really appreciate it um and yeah thank thank you for the opportunity this is this has been super super cool thank you so much for listening to this episode of the zero to play podcast i hope you learned something about game development the games industry as a whole or the future of games you can follow us on Twitter at zero to play subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Spotify, or any other podcasting service. Other than that, you can find links to this episode down in the description below, and I'll see you guys next week for the next episode.